I love how I was like, I'm going to film a video about trans things, which is a arguably kind of controversial topic. Shouldn't be, but it is. And I decided to dress the most unprofessionally that I possibly can for this video. And honestly, I respect it. It's a power move. I don't know. I don't know why I did that, but we're here. Anyway, hi. Um, we've talked about the intersection of autism and transness before, but we did that two years ago, way back when I thought I was a cis girl. <laughs> Throwback. So now um, I understand the concept of nuance, and also I am a trans non-binary person, so I figured we would revisit the topic and look, you know, at the topic a little, a little bit more broadly, with a little bit, a little bit more going on. But first, if you're new here, or if you're not, and you just want to hear me talk about myself. Hi there, hello! My name is Sydney, my pronouns are they, them. I am an openly autistic, queer, disabled, autistic, trans, non-binary person. I work as an actor, composer, educator, advocate, and I am currently working on a thesis that is making world history. You can learn about it, the link's in the description, because I don't feel like talking about it right now. I'm a white person, in the early 20s. Um, I have short, light brown braids, two braids. I'm wearing a backwards gray baseball cap, and my shirt is a teal button-up with white cacti on it, and I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf that has a red stuffed animal dragon over my left shoulder. Because, you know, we're going with professionalism to talk about something that I will probably get a lot of hate comments for. Great, we're going to start with the data, then we're going to interpret said data, and then we're going to discuss the interact intersections. I was going to say interactions and intersections at the same time as I said interactions. Intersections of identity and why these relationships and connections exist, and then talk about how autism and gender and sexuality are related for me. Hope that's cool with you. Not that you have a choice because you're watching the video. Let's get into it. Also, um, all of these studies are linked in the description if you want to check them out yourself. Some of the articles that I read were very interesting reads, so I do recommend them if you have the time. But anyway, a 2017 study of nearly 650,000 people, that's a lot of people, found that of all of the cis people in the study, 5% of them were autistic. Of all of the trans people in the study, 24% of them were autistic. A 2018 study of 675 autistics found that 100 of them were trans, which is nearly 15% of the population, and that only 6 out of those 100 were binary trans. And the rates of transness in the autistic population is two to three times higher than the general population, according to one study. Another study I looked at said that autistics are 7.59 times more likely to express gender variance than the gender pub gender general public. Um, I've heard anywhere from three to eight times throughout like social spaces in the community, so I expect that it is just different based on where you look and what particular population you study. Particularly because we know that autistic people are often never di- many autistic people are often never diagnosed and or may not even know they are autistic, so that would inevitably skew some results. But the fun thing is, scientists had the same thought when they were researching this, and that is how we got studies saying things like gender diverse people are also more likely to report autism traits and to suspect they have undiagnosed autism. Where we can see that trans people are five times more likely to suspect that they have undiagnosed autism than cis people. We also know that they report significantly more traits associated with autism, such as sensory difficulties, pattern recognition skills, and lower rates of empathy. But like, as empathy is measured by a very specific version of empathy that is very neurotypical centered, so it doesn't matter, but it's an important data point, so I'm throwing it in here. A 2017 study of gender dysphoria found that 75% of the dysphoric participants had ADHD. A study of gender clinics from 2004 to 2007 found that incidences of autism were 10 times higher than the general public. And a more recent study from 2011 to 2013 found that more than half of the young people referred to this gender clinic were autistic, which I'm not surprised by the numbers. I'm not surprised that they're this high because I exist within the autism community and I do not know a single trans person that is not autistic. Um, but still, seeing that as researched, peer-reviewed fact really threw me for a loop. I keep looking at myself in the viewfinder and I'm horrified at what I see. Anyway, in regards to sexuality, 4.5% of Americans identify as not heterosexual. 15 to 35% of autistic Americans identify as not heterosexual, which is four to eight times the rate among the general public. That same study also found that autistic men are more likely to be straight than autistic women are. I know gender binary bad, but 
Still just throwing it out there, I find it interesting. And a 2018 study that I forgot to write down particularly where it came from, which is driving me up the wall, found that almost 70% of autistic people identify as not heterosexual. Similar relationships between queerness and transness and various mental health conditions and neurodivergencies have been found at similar rates, but nobody's entirely sure if that's the case because there is a link to all neurodivergency or because of the fact that autistic people also usually are diagnosed with like every mental illness under the sun and also many people with a lot of mental illnesses are actually autistic and don't know it. Um, so it, it very well could be that. I would assume it's probably that. But let us expand this to wider disability. Quantitative studies in Canada and the US conclude that a significant percentage of the trans population is disabled. 55% of the trans population of Ontario and 39% in the US live with disability or chronic illness. The rates of transness in disabled populations are highest in populations with mental disabilities, a combination of physical and mental disabilities, or those with chronic illnesses. Keep that fact in your brain. We're gonna to return to it in a bit. But first, let's talk about the why. There are so many theories as to why there is such a close relationship between autism and trans identities. The first one that we're gonna quickly throw right out the window is that some scientists think that the thing that causes autism in the brain of a developing fetus is also the same thing that causes transness in the brain of a developing fetus. Or like, autism and gender development are, are somehow co-occurring. Which I don't think we should be trying to find biological causes for either sexuality or autism because that's a slippery slope to eugenics, but I'm stating the point anyway to be thorough in reporting my research. So, now you have it, we'll throw it out the window. The things that maybe actually somewhat matter include a discussion of social norms. As neurodivergent people are less likely to adapt to social norms, they are more likely to question and explore their gender and or sexual identities. So basically, we're more likely to question and explore things because we, we, we care less about social norms, so not fitting in doesn't really matter to us because we just don't fit in in general. And we're also quite used to the fact that we don't fit in anywhere, so the idea of, oh, I don't fit into any gender category isn't wildly difficult to process or accept because that just checks out. There's also the idea that the kind of rigid black and white thinking that is characteristic of autism might lead people with mild or moderate gender nonconformity to believe that they are not the sex they were assigned at birth is an interesting thing to ponder. It feels kind of gross to me and I'm not sure why. So there's that. Oh, and the fact that when we talk about disabled people in media, we often see ourselves as degendered and desexualized. So even typical gender and sexuality for a disabled person is already deviating from the expected norms. So. Again, we have nothing to lose on some level. And something really important that I, I didn't really see in, in many places in the research, but maybe I missed it. A lot of autistic traits and a lot of traits of gender dysphoria present very similarly. Somebody who constantly feels gross because they have the body parts that they do not want is going to have low confidence, be a lot quieter, be more introverted. They're gonna avoid eye contact. They're gonna wanna spend a lot of time alone. They're gonna kind of fold into themselves. They're gonna hyperfixate on random things to cope with the world. They're gonna dissociate more because they don't wanna be here. They're also going to probably have atypical social skills, higher rates of anxiety and overwhelm, sensory issues because their body feels just wrong. And this sort of stereotypical representation of autism as it's traditionally diagnosed is the exact same thing. And I'm not saying that autistic people just need to trans their gender, that'll fix their autism, or that trans people diagnosed as autistic are in fact not autistic. And also you don't need to experience gender dysphoria to, to be trans. But it's important to recognize that just like in general, there is significant trait overlap between these two groups simply because of how these groups of people interact with the world. But all of that being said, we do need to ask ourselves, why does this matter? Why do we need to rationalize and explain this relationship? And why do we keep looking at sexuality and mental illness as comorbidities of each other? Because I mean, on one level, like the way that the autistic community has gone, hey, to the people with ADHD and sensory processing disorder who are also trans, you might, you might be autistic and you should probably look into that. That's helped a lot of people to understand themselves and it's super important. And intersectional care and accessibility is also super, super important. But something sits weird to me as to why scientists are trying to explain the reason that these two conditions co-occur. Because being gay or trans is not a condition or a disorder. It's not a mental illness. And I get that it was in the DSM at one point, but also so was a mental illness that supposedly caused slaves to run away from their masters. So I don't think we can use existence in the DSM to show any form of validity. We are on a slippery slope between, ooh, interesting science, and oh no, we did a eugenics. 
But honestly, that's how most science works, so I'm not really surprised. But this is genuinely an issue in the medical field because people view autism and trans identities as so intertwined that transness is often listed as a symptom of autism. And therefore, some clinicians and researchers have considered gender diversity in autistic youth to be a special interest phase rather than a persistent identity. Unfortunately, this interpretation has led many families and healthcare providers to mistakenly dismiss the child's gender diversity as a symptom of autism. Many doctors will deny gender affirming care for their patients because they say that you need to cure the autism autism first to see if this whole trans thing is really real. 32% of autistic gender diverse adolescents say that their gender identity has been questioned because of their diagnosis. And a lot of this directly ties into access to gender affirming medical care, life-saving gender affirming medical care. And many clinics around the world will automatically deny you gender affirming care if you have an autism diagnosis. That's growing less and less common over time, but I know many people who've faced unnecessary extra barriers because of their neurotype, which is absurd because gender affirming care is already way too difficult to get. And it's also important to recognize the intersectionality here. Impairments and ableism sometimes become obstacles to the realization of gender identity, and how, on the other hand, gender identity and cisgenderism can sometimes become disabling. Wearing a binder, for example, can prevent you from being able to do certain things because exercising in a binder isn't really safe, but a lot of people don't feel safe or comfortable not wearing a binder, especially if they're exercising. Being constantly misgendered, as we've talked about before, can make anxiety run so high that a person loses their ability to leave the house that is inherently disabling. And then we have the fact that the queer community is notorious for their inaccessibility. Now the queerness is no longer seen as a mental illness or a disability, the movement has tried its hardest to distance itself from any representations of disability or mental illness in order to move forward to getting rights and be seen as legitimate, which leaves disabled queer people in a really weird and uncomfortable in-between. Lack of accessibility and ableism reproduced in certain trans circles can also contribute to the isolation of disabled trans people in relation to the communities, resources, and spaces that could be key factors of resilience against cisgenderism. Learning to accept your minority identity means on some level being connected to the community of that minority identity. So when your community doesn't make their spaces accessible to you at all, it's hard to accept your minority identity and become proud of yourself for that and you become more at risk. And that is where the minority stress model comes in. The minority stress model, also known as the minority stress theory, basically states that marginalized people experience distinct and chronic stressors related to their minority status that negatively impact quality of life. And that people at the intersection of one or more minority groups experience these stressors compounded on top of each other. And what does chronic stress do to people? Oh, that's right, it causes chronic illnesses, disabilities, mental illnesses, specifically depression, anxiety, complex PTSD, chronic migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, dysautonomic disorders like POTS and autoimmune disorders. And what are the most common comorbidities for autistic people? Oh, that's right, depression, anxiety, uh, complex PTSD, chronic migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, dysautonomic disorders like POTS and autoimmune disorders. It's almost like our societal framework perpetually punishing people who differ from the norm is not working. It's so weird how that happens. I'm so surprised. But I will say that as a human with pretty much all of the above, most of these things I have lived with my whole life, so I just assume like whatever made my brain autistic also made my body wonky. But I also know that children start to internalize social norms around the age of three. And I've spoken before about how when going through home videos of baby Sydney, I can literally see my happy, flappy, stimmy kid self switch right around my third birthday to somebody who never made eye contact, stayed unnaturally still, and didn't express myself as much. So I'm wondering if these things that I've had my whole life actually started from the chronic stress of being a trans autistic kid experiencing the world for a first time and not knowing that the world was inaccessible to my identity because I didn't know my identity. And then all of these things, they all majorly flared up and became genuine life issues and solid disabilities during my various burnout high stress periods that I've had throughout my life. And each time my symptoms become worse and worse and more obvious. And obviously all of this is just theory, but I've been researching the minority stress model and the biopsychosocial model of mental illness in my clinical statistics class. And I'm starting to put all of these pieces together. And I'm wondering if trans kids didn't feel right in their own bodies or in the gendered social norms put upon them when they were younger and they didn't have the words for that until much later in life, so that caused them over time to have chronic stress and develop these disabilities from that chronic stress. And that is why there is such an obvious correlation. Another interesting thing that I've been thinking about is how many queer stereotypes are just autistic traits or can easily be traced back to them. For example, the whole gays can't sit properly Autistic people often have terrible proprioception, aka spatial awareness, and will therefore sit weirdly all the time and find themselves most comfortable in the oddest of positions. The dysphoria walk and the autism walk look very similar as well. We can also link that to proprioception and proprioception issues to the trope of gay people can't drive 
as well. Um, also, the trope of U-Hauling, if you don't know what that is, is a trope about how lesbians moved in together after like the second date, and I hate how accurate it is, because it is so accurate. But we know that autistic people tend to find new people, especially ones they're attracted to, to be special interests that we think about constantly. And we can also very much go from just met each other to absolute best friends in an hour solely because of how autistic people socialize. And that would explain that. And the joke that every lesbian is best friends with all of their exes, every single close relationship that I have with another autistic person looks identically to a romantic relationship, with the exception of the fact that we don't. We do kiss each other's heads and hands and foreheads, but, but we don't like, make out. So for a lot of lesbian relationships, once they break up, it's the exact same relationship dynamic. They just stop making out with each other. So it would make sense that they remain friends. Even the pillow princess trope, if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a gay schmacks thing. Google it. It makes complete sense because intimacy is a sensory experience and people may like Whatever the opposite of a shutdown is, like a like a like a good a good shutdown, that could happen to them, and therefore they just kind of exist rather than entirely engage in activities. Um, if you have any other stereotype overlaps, please let me know in the comments because I'm enjoying putting together the pieces of this little conspiracy theory that I have going on. But anyway, all of these hot takes aside, I know that a large part of why I'm not attracted to cis men is because I've spent so long training myself how to socially act as a girl to come across as normal that I understand their social norms very, very well at this point, and so I feel much safer with them. I was raised as a girl and told that cis men would probably take advantage of me and that I'm extra vulnerable because I'm a very trusting person and I should be very careful around them. And so since I knew that I was very easily taken advantage of in general, I never bothered to even try to figure out their social norms and I just avoided men and I still struggle to feel safe around them. And I would assume that feelings of safety are a huge part of attraction. So, I don't know, just an interesting overlap that I realized recently. I also recently realized that a large part of why gender feels so gross and icky and dysphoric to me is because all of my masks, like how I try to act typical to interact with the world by habit, are girls. I spent my whole life training myself how to come across as a perfectly normal girl, and it was exhausting. And once I learned I was autistic and I started to learn how to unmask and figure out who I truly am and become that person, those masks and social scripts from before, the ones very steeped in traditional norms of femininity, felt not just unnatural, but also gross. They felt fake and artificial and just like sticky. I can only describe it as like sticky. And every time that I get caught off guard and I have to have a scripted conversation with somebody, my voice becomes really high and I'm like, how are you doing today? I hope you're having a good day. And I talk like that and it's this whole fake conversation. And I think over time, my brain has started to associate this high level of femininity with, you know, this feeling of acting. And gender dysphoria can be described as feeling gross in your body and having your body not feel like it's yours, like there's a mismatch. So it would make sense that I would experience gender dysphoria from putting on my masks to seem not autistic. And I feel gross about it because I'm recognizing that there was a direct mismatch between who I am and how I'm presenting myself to the world, which is dysphoria and it feels gross. And wearing more masculine clothing makes my brain click into a different gear because I feel like I'm a different person because I never really dressed masculine before. So it's easier to break that masking habit and feel more natural and more confident. It all just, it all just kind of clicked into place that way. And that's just how I am who I am. So while transness and queerness and disability and neurodivergency are not all comorbidities of each other, they all very much interact and relate to each other and help to shape the experiences of the people in any and all of those groups which is a reminder of why we really need to work on making pride and general queer spaces accessible, why it's so important to fight for trans kids. We just really gotta fight for trans kids right now, why we need to be intersectional in our activism, and why you should really make sure that when you're making something accessible, you're keeping in mind queer and trans accessibility as well, particularly in respecting pronouns, because for some reason that's still really difficult for people and I don't understand why. If you don't know how pronouns work or you have a family friend or parent who doesn't understand pronouns, I have a video up here that is like, only vaguely passive aggressive that you can send to them. Um, but let me know what you think about all of this. If any of these things resonate with you or you have experiences to add to the conversation, I'm still very much learning about my gender and sexuality because all of it feels kind of new. Um, reminder to keep the comment section friendly and kind. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over. I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.